Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew. It is Matthew 25, verses 40 through 45. This is Jesus talking. The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick in prison, and we didn't help you? He will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of these, the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The word of God for us, the people of God, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you in all ways, for you are our rock and our ever-present Redeemer. Amen. It's coming up. There it is. Forest and trees. How much of our lives is dominated by the forest and trees. How applicable is that to all aspects of our lives? Well, first, let's make sure we know what the forest and trees metaphor means. One person said this. He said, to say the idiom, I don't know why they had it, it it's a saying or expression, but to say the idiom cannot see the forest for the trees means that a person or organization cannot see the big picture because the focus is too much on the details. It would be like someone needing to paint an entire house in one day, but spending half the day picking out the right color. I've never seen that happen. <clears throat> Webster's Dictionary says, to miss the forest for the trees is to not understand or appreciate a larger situation, problem, etc., because one is considering only a part of it. And a third person said this, it's pretty clear you could just simply say, you can't see the whole because the parts are obstructing your view. But that lacks the poetry of the famous axiom. This is a wonderful opportunity to talk about the beauty of that famous saying, the repetition of the for sound in both forest and the word for itself is pleasant to the ear. There's the lovely consonants of the T sound at the end of forest and the T sound at the beginning of trees. And what about the assonance between C and trees? a thing of beauty. And that may be the best, albeit inadvertent, explanation of the forest and trees saying, if just by example. How many times have we neglected, or worse yet, even elected consciously, when seeing someone hungry, give them nothing to eat? When seeing someone thirsty, give them nothing to drink? We saw a stranger, but didn't invite them in. Saw someone needing clothing, but didn't provide clothing. I remember once we were driving home on, on I-10 and at City Park Avenue saw somebody with one shoe and we went home and got him, a sh got him shoes. It was the, an amazing moment, but you don't think about those moments sometimes, but those people are out there. Or sick in the hospital and we did not visit. Or in prison, and as Jesus put it in today's scripture, you did not look after me. I think Jesus is employing in this scripture today the tactic we refer to as cutting to the chase. He's saying, here's how important this is. When you do or don't do these things for other people, it's like you're doing them or not doing them for me. The corollary to that is Jesus saying this, get out of your own heads and simply do these things. They are vitally important. Now, as it relates to maybe the, the toughest sell within that whole list of items for us is taking care of those people in prison, including visiting them. Here's what the writer of Hebrews says about that. He says, continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison. He didn't say, evaluate the crime and then decide what you think is proper. The writer of Hebrews said, Irrespective of what they did, put you, they did, put yourself in their shoes in prison with them 
and get to the task of caring for those people. You know, prison is a pretty common theme in the New Testament. Jesus himself was essentially put in prison except for the fact that his trial and his crucifixion occurred so quickly, yet the visitors were there. He had Simon of Cyrene who helped Jesus carry the cross, sort of an inadvertent visitor, but he was a visitor. And then you had Mary, his mother, Mary Magdalene, and then the third Mary at the foot of the cross when he was crucified. And don't forget Paul and Silas who were beaten and then thrown into jail for just preaching the good news about Jesus. Scripture tells us while they're in jail in the middle of the night, you may know this one, they're praying after being beaten, they're praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners are listening to them, and suddenly there's an earthquake, and it shakes the prison foundations, and all at once the prison doors fly open, and every prisoner's chains came loose. And the jailer wakes up, and he figures, they're leaving, they're out of here, this is going to be blamed on me, and he is going to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him and said, don't harm yourself, we are all here and the jailer asks for lights, rushes in, sees the prisoners all there, and falls at the feet of Paul and Silas, and then says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That scriptural passage about Paul and Silas, combined with Jesus' arrest, says to me at least two things. One, being a truly dialed-in effective Christian may land you in prison, as well as who are we to judge that people in prison are unworthy of us. You know, I believe sometimes we internally vindicate ourselves on, being, on the being charitable score simply because we'll adopt a certain cause, let's say, for which we have a particular passion. And we get focused super deeply on that. We get riled up. We get very empathetic. And then we may tackle that charitable activity with a vengeance, hopefully just not so we get our name on the shiny sheet of do-gooders, but in any event, we focus so hard on that one aspect, one need, that it can become a tree that we stare at and we miss the forest of the other needs around us. I think I've told you before about the person who informed me that she gives a dollar to this guy on the street corner over here, but not to this one over here because the latter is a fraud, as if Jesus left it up to us to make those types of distinctions about apparently impoverished people. I can hear Jesus' response right now to the inane description of that vetting process. Thou, give me a break. It was that way a couple years ago at the Carrollton Interchange, people begging there, and there were stories floating around on social media that a woman was eight and a half months pregnant for 17 months straight. And that this one drove a car and parked it over there so we couldn't see the car as if these folks had it made. They were working the system. And I remember walking up to one of the most regularly visible persons on that corner and asking him, where do you live? And he looked at me, and you know when someone's fibbing to you or telling the truth, and I knew he was telling the truth. And he pointed and he said, right under that bridge over there. Nah, you don't need my help. Thou, give me a break. So I encourage each of us to ask, even as I completely ask inside my own heart, what should this change look like in our lives? Right now, what does it look like to have the hearts that propel us to do these things, to love one another like Jesus describes? When we see our brothers and sisters right around us or far away from us, and they are in need. What tree have we put in front of us that blocks our willingness to act when we know there are a forest of hungry and thirsty brothers and sisters out there? What barricades have we erected that keep us from regularly visiting the sick or the bedridden or those in prison? To refer to another biblical metaphor, what is the log in our eye when we see people who are strangers and who need a church, but we don't make it a point to invite people like that every week to our church. And yes, in case you were wondering, those unbelievers, they deserve our mercy as well. Jesus was emphatic on that point. He said, if we only love those who love us, if we only do good to people who do good to us, then we're no different than the unbelievers who do exactly the same thing. So, 
back to our original question about how much of our lives are dominated by circumstances to which the forest and trees metaphor applies. It may be the case that most of our life is dominated by that issue, which, if I understand the metaphor, it's not a good thing. Here in the scripture today, though, Jesus is giving us an instruction, a pathway, which not only helps people in need, but as it turns out, it can help us get out of our rut of micro-focusing on the wrong things, majoring in the minor stuff, and missing the forest for the trees in all sorts of things in our lives. So imagine this, taking a step back and examining the forest, recognizing for the first time a need or an issue, and with Jesus at your side, addressing for someone a need that you never before thought of addressing, and hearing the king say to you, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. Let us pray. God, you give us so much life and breath and, Lord, opportunity in front of us, Lord, that we ignore, that we push aside as we focus on, on things that we conceive to be more important to us. But Lord, what's important is what's important to you. And Lord, help us as we pray to you daily to be able to wrap our minds around, to be able to understand, to have your wisdom imparted on us on what is important, important to you so that we can focus our lives on that, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen.